Well, we'd like to thank everybody for supporting and watching the VinWiki channel over these years and growing. Uh, it's been a wonderful part for me to have in my life, and this is one million subscribers! <laughs> Are you kidding me? So you guys asked me some wonderful questions for the AMA today, which seem to be grouped into car questions, go figure, business and genius garage related questions, personal questions, and the like and build. So let's get started. If you could only have one car for the rest of your life, what would it be? Well, you could put a lot of different uh, things on that, uh, like what will the future be and all. But if I had to answer that succinctly, I would say, my Dodge Viper. It really is the perfect car for me, and I intend to keep it for the rest of my life and enjoy it. And one day, if I can't drive anymore, then I hope there is a neat young person who will like to carry that torch. If you had $3,000 to spend on a daily driver that maximizes fun and reliability, what would you buy? Okay, so that budget, I don't think of that often because I'm now getting older, so I revert to the time period I thought about that more. But if I had three grand to spend on one daily driver, I would probably try to find a Volkswagen Corrado because they look cool. I like driving them. They're youthful and exciting, but I feel like you can show up to a business meeting or an interview and not feel bad about it. And if you look and you can find one, I bet you can still find a nice one for that price. Of course, Volkswagen community is really great too. So Volkswagen Corrado. What is the hardest part of racing cars on the track? And could you have as much fun in an automatic as a manual? Well, obviously there's a lot of factors that go into racing. Uh, it can be an extreme environment, high heat. Uh, obviously there's a lot of risk and uh, requires a lot of talent. But at the end of the day, the secret that no racing driver will tell you all is that you're still just making something go fast, which relates to when you're a little kid on a bicycle doing jumps and stuff. So the hardest part I would say is just having uh, interpersonal uh, and emotional discipline, so that no matter what happens, no matter the risk, no matter the horrible environment, no matter if a uh, competitor's baiting you or bad things are happening that are unfair, that you still maintain a calm, present, and decisive mental state throughout the whole thing. So that, that's the biggest key to race car driving. And could I have as much fun in an automatic as a manual? Uh, no, no I could not. I think automatics are boring and I like the personal satisfaction of doing a job well done. <laughs> so it's a gated community for me. If an alien landed on Earth and wanted to see our most advanced vehicle, what would you show it? Okay, so I actually wouldn't show it a car. I would be like, come and look at this nuclear aircraft carrier with this giant city of people that are all working together to do something. And then I'd have to explain them what the military is all about and humankind. So then I'd be like, but check this out. And I would probably show them like a three-masted clipper ship from the 1800s, the fastest sailing ship, so the tea trade, because it's a little more harmonious with the earth, but still getting things done for mankind. But you guys probably wanted to hear about cars. So I would say, hey, alien, uh, this is the world making way too overly complex hypercars, but check out my Omega car prototype. It's going to be recyclable and people can afford it for the future. So a little more harmonious for the future, but still being cool. So that's what I'd do. What is the worst accident you have been in? I'm assuming this means motor vehicles. Uh, I have done a good job at avoiding that pretty well. Uh, certainly there's times that I, if I didn't avoid, it would have been bad. Let's see. I mean, you have little incidents on the track, like a competitor decides they want to try to J-turn you in front of the pits because they don't like you. Uh, but you get out of that uh, and that gets pretty hot and heavy. Haven't had any big accidents racing. Uh, you know, I got beat around in kart racing back in the day, probably a few cracked ribs here and there. But I think the worst accident I had was a Ducati motorcycle when I was hot and bothered by a girlfriend when I was in my early 20s being stupid and went ripping out of a, um, a sealed blacktop driveway uh, like an idiot and dove on the front brakes because I was mad and instantaneously washed out and tumbled and skinned myself up while I watched the Ducati slide out into the street. Fortunately, no one was driving the street at the time. So uh, again, going back to the racing thing about keeping your mental discipline in order, really important with motorcycles when you're young too. How did you get into cars? Uh, well, when I was a really little kid, I loved trains and steam locomotives and animals. That's what I was way into. Uh, cars started coming a little bit later. Of course, I think any little boy likes to go fast and move on wheels, but uh, great memories from growing up was going to Middle Ohio Sports Car Course as a little kid, uh, watching the races, seeing races on TV. My dad tinkered with old British cars, so I was around that. But I think the thing that really started driving that was as a little kid getting to be hands-on with slot cars and radio control cars and modifying them and racing them. 
uh, and getting to see it and dream of things at going to the track like at Mid Ohio. Of course, eating pizza at Thunder Valley under the trees and watching car goes by. Wonderful, wonderful memories. So that, that's what did it. What are your favorite Porsche 944 mods? Well, truthfully, Porsche 944 is a pretty darn good car as is. So I don't think it requires anything crazy. I know people like to LS swap them, but I kind of like the car as is. My favorite would be steering wheel. I love the old Momo Prototipo and you know, like a Momo Monte Carlo, those look good. So you want to do that, personalize it. I think if you put on a, uh, an aluminum gas pedal that's a little wider on the left, that brings the gas pedal level up a little closer to you and over so you can do an efficient tow hill downshift. Uh, and also the uh, putting on the circular cam for the throttle um, makes the car uh, even nicer to drive and connect with. Of course, it, it's always fun if you make it a little louder too. What car do you own or have owned that has the most meaningful story? Well, that one's pretty simple. Uh, my Dodge Viper. Um, bought it way back when, ended up at Nelson Ledges. Happened to see the car a gentleman had there. I said, sir, can I take a look at it? I'd love to get one someday. And he's like, hey, drive on the track if you want. I'm like, okay. Uh, of course, fell in love with it. And he said he was thinking of selling it. And he gave me a screaming deal on a car. Uh, fell in love with it, drove it, drove it, drove it, drove it. Eventually somebody blazed across five lanes of traffic that I couldn't avoid and the car got totaled. It went away. Somebody kind of put it together, sort of half ass, uh, and called me and wanted to sell it. I bought it back for a song and decided this is my car. I'm keeping it forever. And in the time that it was gone, I missed it. So I still have that. Uh, and I think it's going to keep making wonderful memories. Uh, of course, it's been a great Benwicky story car too. What car do you regret selling the most? Oh man. Uh, my Countach. And not necessarily for the reason you'd think. I grew up loving the Countach. I thought it was beautiful. For me, as a car guy and somebody that's into building it, it was like that 1970s Le Mans prototype for the street in fashionable clothing. So, so cool. You know, this manly gated shifter, V12 in the back. I knew that if I didn't get one way back then, the prices would go up and never be able to touch one again. And it took everything I could, and I finally did it, and I found it. It was a cantankerous fixer-upper. <laughs> But I got it and I had it for a couple years and the prices weren't doing anything and I was trying to do something with my own life and I you know, need capital things to move forward and ended up selling it and um, before doing Genius Garage and that allowed me to build Genius Garage. But in the time since, uh, I've had to live very leanly for creating something like Genius Garage and since that time, that Countach has traded hands for an amount of money that would buy me a really amazing house and a Murcielago and probably a load of other things, which stings. But the thing that hurts the most is that what the prices did potentially has made it that I don't know if I'll ever be able to afford one again, uh, because right now my life path is on building an educational organization, which is not the most lucrative thing for the person building it. So it's kind of been an interpersonal sort of thing, like um, I gave up the thing that I really enjoyed, I got all the personal enjoyment out of, uh, and may never get to do that again. So uh, a good reason why the Lycan build will be fun. I get to build something even better with the students. But I miss my Countach. Someday I really hope I get to enjoy one of those again. What's the fastest speed you have traveled in a car? Well, uh, I do primarily road course racing stuff. So the speeds aren't as fast as if you were on a closed circuit oval. So I'm thinking probably that 180 mile an hour, 185 mark is probably where you're topping out in maybe the end of your champ car on some of those straightaways. And you know, that's a pretty reasonable speed for a, uh, you know, uh, public roadway too. But I'm not saying I've ever done that. What is your five car dream garage? Dreams are crazy things, aren't they? So I don't want to get too existential and think too much about it. So let's just name them. I've got to have, in no particular order, the Chaparral 2A002 chassis. That's the crazy one that won Sebring in 1965 and then got all the louvers. It has like the two-speed um, dog box with the torque converter and the Zumi headers. I just love that car, it's super evocative. My next one would be a 1958 pontooned fendered Ferrari Testarossa. I just think they're beautiful with the craftsmanship. I love that it's open cockpit. I think it's like a, a Swiss watch with the skeleton you can see and I could just like smell it and taste it and drive it. And, oh yes, I think that would be awesome. Uh, I would love to have a 1920s big Bentley when they were wild and wooly, you know, a uh, dream of doing something like Paris to Peking, just a rugged car from the 20s. I think that's super cool. 
or two around Europe. Okay, so let's see. Those are all wacky, not very usable cars. So I probably better get something that's more usable. I think I gotta have my silly Countach back. Or if not that, for something new, I really like F40s. Carbon fiber monocoque race car for the street and totally evocative from that time period when I was a young man. And, uh, Gosh, what else? See, that's not even that super usable of a car. Who needs, if you have five car dream car, you don't need to have anything that overly usable. I think the last one, what the heck? How about a Lancia Stratos? Yes, that would be fun. Why do you think hydrogen fuel cells aren't more common or popular? Uh, pretty simple. The last century has been built on steel and powered by oil. And you've probably heard the names like Carnegie and Rockefeller, Rockefeller before, even though they've been dead a long time. Old habits die hard and our entire civilization is built on those two things. So it's difficult to make things happen for the betterment of mankind, civilization, and the earth, even if they potentially are better. So that probably has a lot to do with it. In your opinion, what is the best fun daily driver? Okay. You're never gonna guess what I'm gonna say. There's been one car that I owned for two and a half years. That's a long time for me on a car that's not my Viper. I'll keep that one forever. But the problem with the Viper is, uh, yeah, if it's cold out or snowing, forget it. Those tires are way too wide, it's just not happening. So it's only a three season car, really. But there's one car I owned for two and a half years. I drove it in all four seasons, snow, ice, rain, summer. Uh, it was my only car and it never broke down and it was super fun. And that is the DMC DeLorean. Yes, I said it. You don't believe it, I don't care. I did it. DeLorean. And I got a buddy with 220,000 miles and climbing on his, so I think they're okay. Uh, this person writes, what are your plans for the Porsche 944 and 928? That's on my personal YouTube channel, I'm doing a build. I uh, called the anti-snob Porsches. Well, I got great deals on them. I bought a 944 1983 old dash stick shift for $3,000 and I got a 1979 Porsche 928 also stick shift with uh, 32,000 miles for $4,500. I like those cars a lot. It doesn't matter to me, they're not worth a bunch. There's great memories from pop culture and life as a child and I enjoy driving those types of cars. So I'm gonna do a sympathetic restoration on things that it needs, get them ready, some tasteful mods and I'm gonna share that on my YouTube channel, Casey Push. So I'm gonna drive them, enjoy them and share them with people. This person writes, what is your best reaction someone had to the Batmobile? <laughs> There's a lot of them. That car completely breaks down the mental boundaries for people between fiction and reality. The greatest ridiculous reactions from a Vin Wiki story before, of course, was being in downtown Columbus. I was doing a photo shoot and I pulled out on this dirt, like abandoned road that was under a railroad tracks behind like the White Castle headquarters. And I was trying to get out for traffic and I look over and there was a sea of creepy clowns. <laughs> Turns out they were fans waiting to get into an ICP concert at the music pavilion down there. And they all just absolutely started freaking out and were probably tripping. So that was crazy. But the one reaction that I always remember, and this is like kind of subtle British humor. I was driving from Tif Little Tiffin, Ohio, like 18,000, 20,000 pe people down to Columbus, Ohio. And the first, I don't know, 30 miles of that is just middle of nowhere countryside, just cornfields, a couple of stop signs, nothing, right? And I'm driving through the, in the Batmobile, all tinted up, you know, the Tim Burton Batmobile, and I'm driving along, and before I get to this microscopic town that maybe has 500 people in it, I was coming down this dip, and there were two dudes on sports bikes coming to me, and the one guy's driving along, but the guy in the back, I can see, like, he's got a full tinted helmet on, I can't even see it, but his body language just said it all. He sort of leaned forward with one hand on the bike and just goes, like, why are you, who, what, what are you do, uh, doing? <laughs> it was, it was so great. I can never make it justice, but that was the best reaction. What was your first car? Well, it was a 1987 Volkswagen Golf GL. Uh, GL stood for not as cool as the GTI. <laughs> it was four doors. It was a dark uh, blue and it was stick shift, wide ratio. And uh, I loved it. It was fun. It was European. That was right before people started doing tuners uh, and getting into the Japanese tuner world. Uh, so I guess I'm kind of like a hipster in the tuning world. And I loved it. It was great fun. Four doors would have been great if I uh, had a bunch of girlfriends and friends back then, but I was a super dork in a small town. Uh, so that didn't happen as much. I did some tasteful mods with a neat like rally wing. I found some better Volkswagen wheels for it, but I couldn't afford cool aftermarket ones. Did uh, some mods to the exhaust, not bolt on. You know, again, had no money, so I'd do it myself. And uh, like welded a, a weight on the shifter. And my coolest mod was I saved up to get a Momo Monte Carlo steering wheel. So that was my first car. It was uh, a good memory. 
If money wasn't a problem, what is the craziest car project you'd like to build? Well, it wouldn't just be a car for me, it'd be a car for the world. Uh, and it would be the evolution of my Omega car prototype uh, because I believe, from what I've seen, there's a lot of ways to make recyclable uh, cars that could be sustainable or more sustainable, either with biological-based materials uh, or just recyclable things that can either be electric, uh, internal combustion, or even hybrid, depending on what part of the world you're in, because I think the world needs affordable cars that are simple uh, and there's less environmental impact, not only with their efficiency, but how they are manufactured and produced. So if I was a big baller, like Elon Musk or something, uh, that is what I'd be doing, and then I'd probably have a crazy secret project where instead of trying to produce the shell and make a car, I would grow it. What is your favorite memory during a race? Oh, probably a couple. Uh, one would be the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix at Shenley Park on the city streets there in my Triumph Powered Devon. Beautiful, glistening, red with a yellow car, kind of like that Ferrari Testarossa I dream of having. Uh, open face helmet, goggles, whole crowd of people, uh, stone walls, uh, curbs, hay bales, old school, like racing in Europe in the 50s, something like that. So just great memories. I loved like coming by that flint wall in the tree canopy in the woods, uh, open face helmet, goggles, the exhaust exo echoing off the flint wall, and uh, turn marshals at the top. It was just so neat. I really feel like I was tra time traveling in that adventure. The other one would be mid Ohio. Uh, I was actually driving the Genius Garage uh, orange and blue prototype car. It was a V8 prototype, 700 horsepower, 2,000 pounds, pretty fast. And we were in a race that uh, was prototype cars and some formula cars. We had a very tight pack, uh, like bumper to tail, bumper to tail. There was a really uh, great Formula 5000 car from the late 70s when they were best. Us, and then a Daytona prototype car uh, right on my tail. It was a beautiful, most beautiful June day in the Midwest you could imagine. Uh, just everything was pretty and glistening of the colors. And it was the last lap and the formula car wasn't in our group. It was the only one leading. And that car just would teleport on braking and acceleration. Uh, and even though I think we were faster by like a 10th of a lap, I couldn't really pass him safely. So I decided, you know what? I'm just gonna hold here. This is still a win. Just gotta make sure I don't do anything stupid with this Daytona prototype. And I just had that moment, it's like, okay, just don't do anything stupid, but enjoy the moment and keep going. And I did, and it was just the most picturesque thing. Have you ever raced shifter carts and would you recommend it to scratch your racing itch? Uh, yes and no, and yes. So shifter carts are the racing carts, sprint racing carts that you shift gears. They effectively have dirt bike motors in them basically and five or six speeds. But also in the sprint cart realm are single speed carts that can race anything from tag or touch and go of the two st stroke engines with a tuned pipe. They have a centrifugal clutch and a single speed. Uh, also things like the Yamaha KT100 two stroke air cooled or even the LO206 Briggs & Stratton based four stroke uh, racing things. I actually highly suggest over getting a shifter cart where you shift gears to a single speed cart. Reason, they're still smoking fast. They're gonna beat the crap out of you. They're gonna hone you as a driver, but the single speed ones, one, they're a bit less expensive than the shifter carts. You're gonna have more competition and more fun no matter where you go. And it will make you a better driver for if in the future you race cars. Uh, shifter carts, I see more young people becoming bad over aggressive drivers in shifter carts because they can shift gears, they get all muscly and bravado and think they're really cool and muscle out of it. Whereas the single speed stuff are still very, very fast, but you have to absolutely conserve your momentum and be right on point with everything. Uh, I also think the single speed carts are a little more enjoyable to drive. So that's my recommendation, but it is the best racing there is uh, and especially for the money. It's actually better racing than car racing. What's your favorite JDM car? I don't think you guys will guess this, and I'm gonna be weird with it. I hear something about the Mark I Toyota MR2 I just like. It's little, it's like folded paper design, uh, and I just think it's neat, and it's not way overpriced. I think it'd be a lot of fun to modify. So, Mark I uh, Toyota MR2. What's your favorite car you have driven? Oh man, um, I am fortunate enough to driven to have driven lots of cars. 
I love my Viper. That's probably the favorite. It's just, it's like the gift that keeps on giving. It's always rewarding. My Countach was the most fun car I had ever had to speed in. <laughs> I'm serious. Driving on the highway, like around Columbus, multiple lanes clean. Um, I'm not like talking like crazy speeding, but enough that, you know, you're, you're probably not gonna get in big trouble if they notice and you're not being too unsafe. But it was really low and you could see out of it. It's an older car, so you don't have to go stupid speeds to feel like you're really doing something. But just kind of smoothly cruising and snaking through traffic, that was really neat. Beyond that, I, uh, I drove a Ferrari 288 GTO once and that was just a really neat car, kind of in between Grand Tour, touring car, supercar, old school Ferrari, new school Ferrari. That was, that was pretty neat too. What is your favorite engine? Oh God, I'm gonna start a war. All right, I'm pretty utilitarian. I like to go fast. I don't like to spend a lot of money and I don't like stuff that breaks. So there's one best choice for that. Small block Chevy. Yeah! It gets the job done, okay? Hate me if you want. There's other engines that sound cooler and neater, but like, if you wanna go fast, small block Chevy. Okay, who is your favorite driver and why? I'm gonna say like probably F1 driver and stuff like that. Um, I don't know why, but the two that I think are cool, for some reason I like Graham Hill, you know, the original Graham Hill, and uh, Dan Gurney. I think those guys were cool. Graham Hill was kind of like that stoic naval captain, like English guy, like gentleman, but bad ass, but never showed it, understated. He was like understated, like noble, bad ass race car driver, just like that guy. And uh, Dan Gurney, man, I feel like, I feel like I would have hung out with him and had a beer. Like he built cars, he engineered, he was a racing bad ass in everything, traveled the world, all American. I think those are my two favorite drivers. What are some challenges the upcoming Petrolhead generation will face? Oh man, you guys. Um, separation of classes, um, the vast divide between uh, the wealthy and normal people. That's gonna be rough for cars. And uh, regulation, silly regulation. Uh, I think if you pay attention to world and culture, the general movers and shakers like to try to regulate and take the uh, individuals power away, either to work on your car, to be a driver, uh, and to be insurable and be personally responsible. Uh, and all those are attributes that are important for petrol heads to work on your own car, to own your own car, to be able to drive it, to be able to insure it, to have that future. Uh, so all those things in culture and life that takes that away uh, is the danger. Uh, Self-driving cars might be neat, but that's a slippery slope for the future. Uh, and I think there's a, a song, what is it? Little Red Barquetta by Rush might have something to do with people projecting those thoughts. So that's what I think is gonna be tough. So get your car, love it, own it, and um, vote intelligently. Whatever it is that you feel is important, I am by no means taking a political stance. How do you feel about electric swaps into classics to modernize them? I'm actually not that into that. Uh, I think classic cars that are special um, should be enjoyed for what they are. Um, electrification, I mean, you don't wanna do period correct electrification because electric stuff back in the day sucked. So you wanna do something modern. Um, and I just don't think they're well suited to it. You know, cutting apart cars to make spaces for batteries largely and where they're gonna be. I just, I'm, I'm not that into it. It takes the soul away. But I am all about uh, taking cars that might be interesting, maybe just not classics that we revere for the history and craftsmanship um, and making them electrified. I love, uh, using old things and making them new. I think that is great for people. I think that's good for the environment actually, so you don't have to go produce new things. And I think that allows people to be clever inventors, engineers, craftsmen, and mechanics. So um, yeah, you know, don't, don't destroy really amazing classics, but you know, walk that line and have fun. No replacement for displacement or forced air. All right, I drive a Dodge Viper. That's the way dad did it. That's the way America does it, and it's worked pretty well so far. No replacement for displacement. Naturally aspirated, baby. It also sounds better. If you could have one track to yourself for a day, what would it be? Well, it's gotta be something I can't go to normally now. Uh, and I may get this wrong because it's off the top of my head, but the Alvis track in Germany in like the 30s? Are you kidding me? I was like, I don't know, five miles a lap or something, like insane high banks of cobblestone with these giant cars with supercharged V12s and V16s that were streamliners with dudes wearing like canvas helmets 
and with a window to look at your tires, so if you start seeing cords, you got about two seconds before they explode and kill you, and they're doing like 250 plus miles an hour in the 30s? Yes! I wanna do that! Moving on to personal questions. Whoa. If you could live in any time period, what would you choose? That is a great topic of discussion, usually for over brown water. But I've learned one thing. It's easy to romanticize another time period that might actually suck to live in. So what I like to say is I actually like living right now. I think this is an amazing time of humanity, human history, because we have cell phones and the internet. And I was a little kid before that, and it sucked because all the weird things that I wanted to learn about, which nobody liked, like fencing or European cars or old slot cars, I couldn't do because it wasn't in the phone book. But when the internet came out, I could be as kooky and eccentric as I want to be and f chase my dreams. And I think that is an amazing thing. Plus we have like, you know, modern medicine and dental and stuff, which didn't exist in the olden days. But if you want me to answer it that way, I, I, I really, there's great romantic times from long, long ago of agrarian times or whatever, but I would love to have existed and lived to where I could be cognizant through the first three quarters of the 20th century. Um, there was, everything happened. Immigrants to new lands, there were world wars, there was the nuclear age, there were jets. I mean, heck, airplanes came to exist back then. We went to the freaking moon. I mean, the time period from the late 1800s, from like La Belle Epoque you know, in France, to the airplane, to just like all the most amazing things that was then. But, you know, those things have inspired us all to right now. So. I gotta pick right now, but I romanticize about those great times of the earlier parts of the 20th century. What do you think about Ed Bolian's haircut? Um, <laughs> makes him harder to fit in the Viper because he's already the height of a giraffe. Um, otherwise, that seems like too much work. You should just be balding like me and all those old guys that are on our dollar bills. What was your worst police encounter? Ooh, that's a good question, isn't it? Um, and generally, in general, I have always found that if you are respectful to the police, they are respectful to you. They have a job to do, and we all live in a civilization with laws. So I keep those things in mind and have generally good experiences. Uh, I did once encounter an officer. I was in a town that I didn't know, <coughs> Monroe, Michigan. And uh, things were not marked well at all. I was at a stoplight. Turns out I was on a one-way street. This was early in the morning. There was no other traffic or parked cars, but I thought it was a two-way street. And I turned left from the right lane onto a street that was one way and I wasn't even supposed to go that way. Immediately realized when I finally saw a sound, turned around, but there was a cop who I think was having a very bad day. That can happen to anyone. Beyond that, the worst encounter I've ever had with a, a police encounter is just angry trolls talking smack about cops on the internet, which kind of makes me sad. How do you deal with left lane squatters? The left lane losers or left lane hogs? Um, <laughs> this question is because I did a video that actually got pretty darn popular on my YouTube channel. Uh, of driving and showing what is with these crazy people that drive under the speed limit or the speed limit in the left lane. Like, get over and let traffic flow. And I, I showed that and I wanted to point it out so we can all move on together as motorists. Uh, but truthfully, the way I deal with left lane squatters, I, I'm, if I'm coming up on them, I see them, I give them a moment to hopefully notice. I would prefer not to have to change lanes to go around them. Uh, because that's just more opportunity for something bad to happen. And if they're not gonna move, I will pass them and go around them on the right. I'll generally look over at them like, what is wrong with you? And usually they're completely oblivious. So how I deal with it is just trying to flow traffic as intelligently as I can, but first giving them the opportunity to move over uh, and follow the rules of the road properly. Uh, but it is a frustrating thing to deal with, and I hope that our lawmakers will um, put that in place so that that can be enforced properly, but more importantly, educated with our drivers in the United States uh, first. And I think that's going to make the roadway safer and more efficient for everybody, also more enjoyable. Will you ever get to launching the Pterosaur off the Viper? Okay, that was from a VinWiki story and also my personal YouTube channel. Uh, I, with Genius Garage, built the world's only full-scale flying Pterosaur model. Those are the winged dinosaurs, only Dinosaurs are technically dinosaurs and pterosaurs are the winged ones. Has a 38 foot wingspan and that is the honest, largest, reasonable estimates of the Quetzalcoatlus Northropi species that died at the end of the Cretaceous area like 60, 70 million years ago. I probably won't honestly launch it from the Viper because it's not easy to capture. The Viper's kind of small, the truck worked better. 
I realized that with the VinWiki video, we were flying at about six feet off the top of the back of the truck in that first test, which maybe wasn't as impressive to the video, but keep in mind it has a 38 foot wingspan. That is the size of a medium fixed wing aircraft. That is scary and wild. Uh, and it was insane when you were there to see it fly. Uh, I think I will launch it again or another. I'd like to redesign the wing membranes. I found that in testing, the airfoil shape was flattening out. We were losing efficiency and had to fly the pterosaur animal model at a higher angle of attack and a little higher speed. So it's gonna be exciting to do that. But yeah, who knows? Maybe I will launch it off the back of the Viper. Stay tuned to my YouTube channel. If you absolutely had to do something else, what would it be? Uh, well, my primary focus in life in terms of career or what I'm trying to create for the world is Genius Garage. And then I try to make money on the side while I'm building that working in cars or something else. So I would probably do something that I think makes you part of a bigger picture uh, and hopefully providing a value to the world or community. Kind of that short answer might be if I had to do it over again, I might think of a career in the uh, armed forces. Uh, or even law enforcement perhaps. It can be a tough job, but someone's gotta do it. And um, the world is a wild place, so I, I might be well suited there. Favorite car to have sex in? <laughs> in or on? Okay, so I'm not gonna exactly answer that question, but I will tell you this. A Corvette C6 coupe, you can pop the hatch on and give yourself a lot more room. And uh, you guys can probably fill in the creative blanks. Favorite anime movie? <laughs> uh, my wife and I are a big fan of Studio Ghibli and the Miyazaki films. Uh, the two that come to mind for me are Porco Rosso, which was an animated film of a disgraced World War I pilot that's a bounty hunter in the Adriatic Sea in a red plane and was cursed and has the face of a pig. It's pretty darn cool. And for some reason, I like Howl's Moving Castle. It's just beautiful music, uh, beautiful scenes, and just some whimsy and fantasy and magic. It's good fun with my wife. Where can we watch the like and build? Uh, my personal YouTube channel and VinWiki. I will be back. We're gonna tell more stories here. I'm sure we're gonna do some great things with the student and Ed in real life too. Uh, but my YouTube channel of Casey Putsch, which will also be the great place that I can show off Genius Garage and everything the students are doing and help um, do shout outs that Genius Garage is recruiting and stuff. So Casey Putsch, YouTube, subscribe. What was your favorite video game growing up? That's a tough one. Um, growing up, I first video game system I had was original Nintendo, 8-bit. It was kind of weird to me at that time in my life. Uh, I liked Rad Racer, probably. The one thing I wished is when I was a little kid, I wasn't smart enough to push the select button and go to 3D and wear the 3D glasses. I never got to do that because I was dumb. I'm like, why do we have these 3D glasses? It doesn't work. But probably my favorite was when uh, Super Nintendo came out, 16-bit, I believe. Uh, the original Mario Kart, yes! That was awesome, loads of fun with that. And then beyond that, Star Fox. That was kind of fun flying space fantasy for me. So those are my favorites. How did you end up as a Ferrari mechanic in college? Well, my freshman year in college at Ohio State, uh, I wanted to get a job. I love bicycles, I love riding, we're working on them. And I ended up getting a job as a bicycle mechanic. I just went by and said, you guys hiring? I work on my own stuff. Here it is, they liked me and I worked for Cycle Tech in Columbus. But I worked on cars uh, in the VinWiki stories you may remember from college. I'm trying to remember what it was titled with the Ferrari. And also the Manta Mirage. I bought a Manta Mirage, that's a V8 kit car. It looks like a McLaren Mark 8C. And in short order, I was able to sell it and uh, frankly double my money or asset value there. And my father had an old Volvo 1800 ES that I somehow talked him into selling. And we combined our funds and bought a um, Okay example of the Ferrari 308 GTSi, the Magnum PI car, red with a black interior. I wasn't confident in doing timing belts at the time and I found a, uh, a service place, NJB Automotive, which is still owned by Jack Babbitt, nice guy, in the Columbus area. When I went down to drop it off, talked to him and the mechanic and they were impressed by me as a young guy working on stuff and my story. And when I came back to pick up the car with my dad, they offered me a job working on Ferraris. So I learned a lot. It was a great opportunity. I gained a lot of confidence as a craftsman and a mechanic and owe a debt of gratitude to Jack at NJB. Uh, so uh, thank you, that's, that's how I did it. So I worked there part-time my senior year of college. You are Batman, right? Yes, I am Batman. Where do you see yourself in 10, 20, or 30 years? Uh, I generally hate these questions um, in, a, in a way. Personally, I think they're silly only because you really can't plan life that well uh, in my experience, but 
the things that I shoot for, uh, one, I uh, intend and uh, like hope to still be married to my lovely wife because I really love our relationship. That's my base, that's for the future. I do hope that I have um, kid or kids. I hope to get blessed with that. I really wanna get my own life and career track <laughs> going well enough so I feel like I can support that. Beyond that, I hope that Genius Garage is an amazing organization all around the United States and world and there are loads of young people getting great things happening in the future. Uh, I hope I have a house that's nice of some kind and a couple of cars that I enjoy and a meaningful life. So that's about it. But if I really wanted to dream, like what would Casey do if he had too much money and he could kind of like just go off? Well, in my mind, I want a beautiful French chateau, right? With gardens and such. You can't see anybody else. There's streams, there's stables, etc. where I only have like one or two cars, but I don't drive them normally. I ride a horse into town and build World War I airplanes for fun and play with hot air balloons. That's my eccentric mind, what I wanna do. We'll see if that happens. Do you have an engineering degree? If so, what kind? No, I do not. I don't. Uh, which I love it when people ask me that because it blows their mind based on all the things that I engineer and build with Genius Garage and teaching with and working engineering students. And I will say this, a person's education throughout life does not begin or end with school. We have these great things called libraries. There's amazing people called mentors and you can learn by doing. And so my entire life has been engineering and building and creating, but in my academic career, believe it or not, I studied uh, within the realm of fine arts, industrial and product design uh, with a little bit of focus on robotics. And I spent a heck of a lot of time all out at the Center for Automotive Research uh, doing hands-on engineering type things when I was in school. So no, my degree formally is not in engineering. How is your public speaking and storytelling so good? Well, thank you for thinking that. Uh, but that's an interesting thing I think I figured out. When I was a, a kid and young person uh, growing up 80s and 90s, I spent a lot of time at the family business, which was this little public golf course in a small town. And all the people that come there and golf or spend time. And they were a lot of retired guys, World War II guys, right? And I would sit around and I would hear all the stories over beer, you know, the 19th hole as a kid. So being around and exposed to all these different people and storytelling, making people laugh, telling jokes, that's really where that came from. And when I was a little kid, my grandfather, he was of course Army Infantry, World War II Pacific, great stories. Uh, his brother, my great uncle, uh, F4s over Vietnam, uh, nuclear uh, B-52s flying in those, incredible stories. Uh, their brother-in-law, uh, Witt, flew every fighter through World War II all the way up to the F-86 Sabre jet. Uh, and we go to the National Museum of the Air Force when I was a little kid and they would tell all the stories. And then growing up, some of the people I hung out with, my fishing buddies, uh, one was a B-17 mechanic in the European theater. Uh, the other guy, he was in Jeeps. And then uh, the old guy uh, that lived close to my parents' house, I'd ride my bicycle over and help him garden and plant tomatoes. And um, he would tell me stories of flying P-38 Lightnings in the Pacific. So I think, that's, I think that's where my storytelling ability came from. How has being featured on VinWiki affected your life and what opportunities do you feel it has opened for the future? Great question. Huge honor to get a come on here. Uh, actually, a student of mine, Austin Wright, connected me with Ed. And uh, my biggest reason for doing this is I hoped I would get some exposure for Genius Garage. Um, and it's done just that. The world has come to find out. VinWiki is a powerful tool in terms of storytelling and connecting the automotive world and culture for the future, as well as the app being great. And it's done just that for Genius Garage. Uh, it's been enjoyable for me, for a lifelong car guy that wasn't really YouTube or anything before that, to get to come on here and share all these wild tales that I've seen has inspired a lot of other younger people out there, people that have bought Vipers and Porsche 944s because they liked my story so much, it inspired them, and that's exciting. But VinWiki's really been just such a wonderful connection to the future of the car community and been a huge lesson for me learning at just how much the world has changed with media. The internet, social media is it. That is a powerful tool and TV and magazines are basically dead. So anything old that uh, cares about the future, you better be thinking about how you can connect to the uh, social media storytellers and channels like this if you, if you, wanna, if you wanna be uh, relevant. So um, it's, been, it's been a great experience being on Benwicky. Would you record my voicemail greeting? Yes, I will. Take this clip. You've reached George Blaney's cell phone and are thinking of leaving a voicemail. 
This is 2020. Send me a text. What is it like having almost everything you could desire? That's a great question. And more importantly, thank you for asking that because I think everybody and people that are really driven and focused on the future uh, sometimes need a moment to have a splash of cold water and look around and smell the flowers. Truthfully, in a way, I, I don't because what I desire is making the future better, better than what I experienced. And I work every day to make that happen. You gotta balance that with having a career, taking care of yourself, um, having a relationship with your wife, um, family in the future. And I hope good things continue to happen. But uh, thank you for saying that. Um, if you watch uh, my YouTube channel, uh, you see pictures from Genius Garage. I, I do sometimes, I'll stop after the day is over and just look and be like, wow, I'm, I'm so proud of everything here. I'm so proud of Genius Garage. And I'm so proud that these amazing cars and airplanes are here to teach. And they mean something to me personally. And I, I dearly love sharing that with people. So when I do get out of the zone for working for the future and take that time, usually it's with friends or with people like you, it's, it's a good feeling. But we keep moving forward for a better tomorrow. What would you say to a young Casey? And there was actually someone else that said, what would you say to yourself at 25 years old? A young Casey, I would say, come with me if you want to live. Uh, <laughs> Basically hindsight is 2020, of course, right? I always did the best I could uh, with what I could perceive is around me at any given time. I would say to myself as a young person, relax a little bit, always be driving forward for the future, but don't take yourself too seriously to have fun. When I was young, it took me a long time to socialize with people my own age. I was a complete dork and nerd in high school, uh, heck, college. Um, I grew up around older people in business and I just wanted to do something with my life. I just didn't feel like it was the time to party and have fun and because of it, I was, I was awkward and I probably, as much as I uh, love my hometown and the good things there, I, I should have moved out of there sooner. Uh, but I was really trying to help with the family business um, and because uh, my dad was really overworked um, and I wanted him to be all right. I should have just went for it sooner. Anyway, come with me if you want to live. What is the answer to life, the universe, and everything? It's 42. Wait, what? No, it's 42. Really? I've thought about this for a long time. It would have been easier if you would have told me what the proper question was though. But yeah, 42. What are the most valuable life lessons you have learned from your mentor? Well, I've had lots of mentors. Um, the lots of mentors, but I think this person may be watch my YouTube channel and also the Mercedes debacle where I'm trying to <laughs> fix this Mercedes for this nice older woman. She come from Europe. Uh, she was Winston Churchill's chief of staff before he died at his estate, worked for Interpol, amazing person with lifetime of wisdom to share all around the world. Um, I think the story that she told me, and she came from um, an aristocratic family in Europe, uh, pretty high end. And this story has even more meaning, I think, because of it. Um, she said when she was a little girl, she had to scrub the steps of their, their home uh, with a brush and get it ready. They were having some sort of party or people over. And um, she knew everybody had to look very nice and dressed and pressed for this, this special party. And as a little girl, she was cleaning and brushing and she got her, just like broke her fingernails and her fingernails were so dirty. Uh, and she started crying because she was afraid she'd look bad for this. I mean, it's a social setting. It, it matters for them back then. And her, I think it was her grandfather or her father, uh, came to her and consoled her and uh, hugged her and held her hands up and said, never be ashamed uh, for an honest or hard day's work. And coming from a noble family, I think that meant, uh, means a lot. So great little lesson. Never feel bad about doing an honest day's work or getting dirty with your hands to better something for the future. What is the message you want to send to your followers or to people in general? Uh, well, everybody out there on YouTube, whether it's VinWiki or my personal channel or Instagram, uh, really thank you for being part of this. Thank you for watching. I enjoy sharing these experiences with you to hopefully inspire you in some way. Uh, and of course, this is all because I wanted to help bolster Genius Garage. So uh, simply thank you. Uh, tr trying to provide a little bit of value to the world, uh, tell the truth about things that might not be seen, uh, be very real, and just provide a value to all us car guys out there. What is your favorite VinWiki moment? <laughs> 
My favorite moment is actually an Ed Bolian story, and I can't remember the exact one, but he was on a test drive, I think in a Lamborghini, it might have been a Gallardo, and this guy decided to just go flat out, just like drive insane, like 100 some miles an hour, right on people's bumper, just absolutely going for it like a lunatic, and it's like, Ed, Ed's like, okay, we need to back down just a little bit, he's trying to be nice, trying to be that right salesman, and this guy is just being nuts. And uh, Ed's going, and, and there's a cop. There's a cop coming up. They're coming up to him. I don't know, triple digits. And Ed's like, that's a cop. Slow down. <laughs> the, guy's, the guy's like, I'm immortal. And Ed's like, we are going to die. Passes the cop, looks over at the cop, goes, what are you doing? Arrest this guy. Favorite moment from Venwicky. Here's a wiffle ball. Best joke about at switch cars, Doug Tabbitt. <laughs> What, aren't they all wiffle balls? My mother said this to me one day when I was a little kid, and this reminds me uh, of Doug, probably the same kind of thing. I go, Mom, why are you keep making fun of me? And she goes, uh, Casey, I don't have to make fun, it's just there. So I guess the only question I would ask to Doug is, um, so at your car dealership, when all the cars are sitting there, do you adjust the seats so normal human beings can get in them? I love you, Doug. Favorite current passenger airliner, Favorite discontinued passenger airliner. Favorite discontinued military plane. Favorite current military plane? Question mark. Okay. Um, passenger airliner's favorite? The Concorde. Come on. Supersonic? Yes. Uh, favorite current uh, passenger airliner? I hate them all. I hate flying commercially. I always feel like we're going to die, and it's not okay with me. I like looking outside, and I'm strapping in, and I don't know who the pilot is, and I'm always looking out going, is this the moment we're gonna stall and dip a wing, and just, I, I hate it, I hate it so much, and I, it scares me. Yeah, I know it's the safest way to travel, allegedly. I don't care. I would rather ride my motorcycle. It freaks me out. Okay, military planes, my favorite discontinued one. I have this kind of fascination, weird love affair. It just speaks to me whenever I see it in the museum walk up to. F-104 Starfighter, yes. 1950s, I think it was America's first supersonic fighter. It had a record in like 1958 out of Edwards doing the better part of Mach 2 and over a 100,000 foot altitude record. I mean, gosh, it's just so romantic. I mean, I mean, I would love to fly an F-104 Starfighter if I ever got the chance. There's still a few flying around the world. Favorite current um, military planes? The, the Tomcat is also a good old one. But current ones, uh, I did get to fly an F-16, spelt, athletic, little, great plane. There's something about an F-15, yes, muscle car in the sky. And um, I hear the F-35 with that cockpit type of thing where they have the uh, helmet and you can see out, but then when you look down, allegedly you can like look through the plane. That sounds really cool. And uh, hopefully maybe one day I get to go up in an F-15 or an F-18. I would love to know if that compares to uh, what I did in the F-16. So, you know, hey Navy, I don't know if you guys are cool. The Air Force is pretty cool, you know. <laughs> maybe you should let me go up with you and we'll find out. Business Genius Garage questions. Would you ever consider putting together a full-time professional racing team? Uh, in thinking of starting a racing team from the ground up professional level, uh, whether that's, I don't know, NASCAR, Endurance, Formula One, Indy, probably not. Uh, massive amount of work, massive amount of getting in there, insane amount of connections. Uh, if I ever was going to lead a racing team that was professional, I would probably want to come onto one or start with something that's already there. Don't know if that's ever going to happen. I wouldn't necessarily be opposed to it, but it does create a certain kind of lifestyle. Uh, so it just have to be the right fit. Uh, with regard to racing, I prefer building the Genius Garage organization because I think I have a uh, bigger positive impact on the world in the future. What is the most gratifying moment you have had with Genius Garage? Uh, it's simple. It's when students uh, tell me afterward, they go to into their job interview, they go through the resume, they see Genius Garage on there, and the hiring people don't even know what to say or do. They're like, so was this a model airplane you built? And the student's like, no, a real one. Like you get in it and fly it. Or like, okay, so this was like, was this like a go-kart? No, it was an Indy car. We went to Indianapolis and raced. And they're like, okay. It blows them away and they get job offers. And when those students tell me about that they got a job and just look at me with that moment of like, this wouldn't happen without you in this place. That means everything because you know that's what I couldn't find as a young person. 
So that's the moment where I find out that my work really did make the world a better place. And um, I'm really excited for those students. How does one donate to Genius Garage? Well, there's many ways to contribute. Uh, obviously, monetarily, uh, if we're gonna do something big label, give me a call and we'll talk about how those funds are gonna be utilized. But you can simply go to the GeniusGarageRacing.com website and right there on the front page, there's an opportunity that you can donate and leave a note uh, through credit cards, PayPal, et cetera. There's also other donations that could be services, parts. Um, if someone has a big car collection and they would love to see a car be utilized for students forevermore, whether that's racing, exotic, whatever, that is a great write-off and a massive asset to us. Could be an airplane, tools, books, hello, ways to learn, or even donating your time as a mentor if possible and helping making things happen or just contributing to hook up Genius Garage of the organizations with sponsors, manufacturers, whatever. So there's great ways to do that. Obviously we have the Lycan build coming up in 2020. So donation of parts for that build, services, engines, shocks, tires, um, and of course any, any monetary contribution goes a long, long way, whether it's $20 or $20,000. That money goes to giving these students the opportunity to do it. Uh, no student has ever charged, been charged to be part of Genius Garage. I've gone out and gotten effectively scholarship funding for them because I think it's important for young people to go far in life and have opportunities based on what's in their head and their hearts and not because of what their last name is. So anything goes a long way. Please look us up and thank you for being part of it if you are, are going to donate. How do I apply to Genius Garage? Well, uh, one you'll find out, we'll put things on out on Genius Garage's social media, on Facebook or Instagram, as well as our website. And of course, uh, my Casey Putsch uh, media on Instagram, as well as YouTube is growing very fast. So of course I'll be doing shout outs. I would suggest for you to follow Genius Garage and myself. Uh, when it's time to apply, uh, typically we do this, a resume of course, outlining all of your experiences. And I know you're young, uh, but even if you worked on a car, you had a job, doesn't matter. I wanna know who you are, what you've done. Uh, where you're going, and then you write a paper. Uh, the paper, the two aspects are saying why you are a good person for the Genius Garage uh, organization and why the Genius Garage experience will matter to your future and where you're going. And when you expand upon that, don't rehash the resume, but I wanna know who you are as a person. Why you being part of it and following through and making our world a better place because you are just as important to the other students that are in the program and all the students in the future, as well as the organization. So you matter if you're part of it. And of course, the Genius Garage experience and opportunity matters to you. So wanna know how you're gonna use your ambition and drive and uh, you and your core values as a good person to go somewhere. So you're gonna write about that. And then of course, we'll contact you and interview you, and we'll go from there. Don't think that you have to be some magical person. You just, you have to be a good person with some ambition. How do you decide what budget to spend on cars? Okay. There's two basic tiers to this. There's the buying and owning the car, and then there's the working on it and modifying it. There's three kinds of cars. There's cars that you can potentially make money on, there's cars that you'll break even on, and there's cars that you will lose money on. Do not buy the cars you will lose money on. I hate depreciation, it sucks. I, I don't like it, that's why I don't buy new cars, and it's just, I think those are terrible investments. E even if you got the money, why lose money? The cars that you'll break even on, don't buy those unless one, you can afford to have the money in it, and you really like it and you need it for utility, something like a, a daily driver, if you can own it for a year or two, maintain it, get a good deal on it and sell it decently where you're probably not gonna lose money, then that's something there. But if it comes down to a car that you, of one of these threes, always go for the one you could theoretically make money on or at least trade up with your asset value or have the least risk. The next part is when you have a car and you're working on it. Generally speaking for modern cars, that people wanna be tuners and build cars, that is a monetary losing proposition. Those car parts are fun to get in the mail. I love building cars, but you have got to know when enough is enough or you cannot afford it. There's plenty of guys out there that are broke, that can't go anywhere, can't finish it, and they have a car. And that's cool, but like it sucks to be broke. And there's a lot more things to life. Uh, I do say sometimes when you have a car and you're a younger person um, that, if you have a car and you have to spend more than like 10 to 15, 20% of the car's value in making the car what you want it to be, it's not the car you want. You need to sell it after you've enjoyed it and then utilize money you make on top of that to get the car you want. So for instance, when I was a younger man, I really love 944s and I've got one right now, but they're not that fast and I want to power slide around. So I sold my car 
without trying to like throw an LS in it and stuff, which is fun, but you know, beefing it up, making tons of power and bought a Corvette because you can start power sliding it and they make more power and they're easier to modify it. So you got to think of that progression. Uh, also remember that time is money, your time. Maybe you're at a time in life where you can afford more time and it's fun to work on cars. And if so, that's great. But when you're buying a car, it's not, it's not free to work on. You have to live, you have to eat, you have to do things. You could also have a job to make money if you weren't working on the car. You could spend it with friends. You could spend it you know, uh, with your wife or girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever, right? So keep those things in mind and try to be very realistic with the time you're gonna to have to put into a car and the, the parts to do it. Uh, I think you'll go the, the furthest ahead. Uh, in terms of budget, uh, Ed said to me, there's some like rule that you're not supposed to spend 10, more than 10% of your net worth on cars. Yeah, car guys don't do that. Uh, my entire net worth is cars, I think. <laughs> Hopefully that'll change. Where do you get the courage to continue with your dream when others tell you it's stupid and get a real job? This is a fantastic question uh, and it's simple. I actually did a YouTube video on my channel, Casey Putch, about the catalyst of drive. I was at Monterey, the historics, and I was hanging out with a guy with a Cosworth DFE Formula One car and there's this uh, cute little girl there with her parents and she was interested in engineering. And I was explaining to her the cooling system and how the air flowed through the car and that when the air flows through the radiator, the heat energy from the water transmits through the aluminum of the radiator into the air and the air heats up and it goes out because the energy goes from a place of high energy or concentration to low, you know, reaching that sort of normalcy of physics. And I bring that up because my drive to continue with something that I believe in that has value for the future, even though it's a tough road and others think it's stupid or I should be making more money or just doing that. Uh, one, it's important. And then I know if I don't do this now, I may never have the chance. The biggest thing is that relates to my analogy is it would be so much harder to live in a world that I didn't do it. The world needs to be better. And even if I was wealthy and had every little toy I ever wanted, it wouldn't matter. Because if I didn't do these things to create and make the world better and just went and got rich, I would just be a rich guy living in a crappy world when I could have made a difference. And newsflash, we don't live forever. Time is ticking. So for me, the easiest thing to do is to simply go out and fight to make the future better because I couldn't live with myself if I didn't. That's how I keep going. What's the next evolution for Genius Garage and would you consider opening another location? Okay, your second part of the question, yes, I would. So here's where I'm going and hopefully I make this happen. First of all, 2020 is gonna be amazing. We're doing the Lycan build. It's gonna be on VinWiki. We're gonna have it on my channel. We're gonna do racing. Unbelievable, great projects that not only will benefit the lives of these students that are there, but everybody out there learning with them and watching on social media and the world through VinWiki and my channel. But with regard to Genius Garage as an organization, uh, there is a massive iceberg below the surface. I am working hard with some incredible and very connected, powerful people who get that this is the educational model for the future and the best way to empower the car culture's history for a sustainable future. So we're setting up a network. My first big thing is to do a beautiful year in 2020, but be gearing up to build a flagship permanent location for Genius Garage, where all these beautiful formulas can work for college age students, younger, in automotive, all the way around, and be a wonderful public asset for a community and the world to be inspired by and come be part of. And then from there, yes, there needs to be other ones in the United States. And when I think about it, West Coast, East Coast, Midwest Detroit, Indianapolis, there's some great places. So I'm going to take this as far as is reasonable on a business and organizational level because it has a powerful impact not only for the students, but for the future of our industry and our car culture, our car culture in the past. So it needs to happen. I'm pushing hard. How and where did you get the jet hanging from the Genius Garage's ceiling? Great question. Uh, that is a BD-5 Microjet, um, and that is most famous in pop culture from the James Bond movie Octopussy with Roger Moore. Uh, in the beginning uh, part of the movie, he had to escape, I don't know, being shot at. They were at some fancy horse thing, and there was a horse trailer, and a little jet popped out. The wings folded down, and he flew it and went through a building and all. It's a real plane. It could be bought and flown. Many have flown through history, both powered by a small jet engine as well as a pusher prop. There's a lot of those kits uh, remaining unfished 
unfinished floating around the United States. Uh, they're a funny little thing. They require a lot of precision to build, a lot of precision to fly, and if you do any of that wrong, there can be big consequences. Uh, a gentleman donated a partially finished kit and parts and plants to Genius Garage from Florida, uh, which is incredibly nice. And in 2019, a student came from these part of Washington State and made that his engineering project. He came from a part of the country with no aerospace engineering opportunities, and we were glad to give him that opportunity. So the BD-5 was put together as a static display with the airframe, and we hung it from the ceiling to inspire and teach. Now I know a bunch of you are gonna be like, Casey, that's not like you not building something that flies. And I, I go, I know, but it serves a great purpose in teaching and building and showing airframes, and it really comes down to business. The amount of money I'd have to spend on the micro turbojet engine to put in that, as well as all the avionics, uh, and everything that goes into it, the time investment and resources, Genius Garage would be much better off going out and buying a uh, Czechoslovakian light two-seat fighter jet, maybe like an L-29, L-39 Albatross, something like that. So there's a reason I have thought about that. And we'll leave it at that. What inspired you to create Genius Garage? Well, I didn't like the way the world was, and I knew I could make it better. Um, I disliked my academic experiences, all the way through high school and especially college. I was way outside of the bell curve um, and school is something that has been created and hasn't changed much since World War II. It's very institutionalized uh, and I'm a person that learns by doing and hands-on and I just I didn't like it. And because I didn't like it as a young person without good mentorship and guidance, I did as much as I could to avoid it and do the least amount of work possible to get through it okay enough so I could do big things on the side. But that, of course, doesn't help an academic career. When I was in college, I found a woeful lack of opportunities to find mentors, real-world opportunities, uh, or to get on your way getting a job. And afterward, I fought to create everything uh, in life, whether that's business, uh, building cars, race cars, uh, airplane-related things, engineering, design. I fought long and hard to build anything for myself. And then uh, about 10 years later after college, I looked around and I saw that I had a facility to create incredible race cars through history that were high points of engineering and sport and design. Uh, and I had a proverbial Rolodex full of amazing people with a lifetime of wisdom to share. And I realized that if I'm gonna be involved with cars and airplanes and racing anyway, I should just do it in a way that's structured that makes a difference for the young people that I didn't have when I was. And, and that was it, that was the spark to create a genius scratch. Year one, I did the biggest bang I could with the IndyCar because I wanted to do something that was so great that the students would get, they would grow to where they could back up getting a job and that they would do something so unbelievable the world could not ignore them. And to extrapolate the way the world ignored me when I was young. It's very disappointing. And I know what that's like. And I know there's a lot of other young people out there who feel like they're falling through the cracks. They could be ama amazing designers, engineers, and leaders of industry tomorrow. So that's why I did it. And uh, it worked, and then it kept working. And I found out it was a very powerful concept. So here I am, still fighting for everybody else. And I really enjoy doing that, it's, it's unbelievable. In your career, what accomplishment are you most proud of? Well, uh, the two things I'm most proud of, I imagine you could guess, but not guess, um, creating the Genius Graduate Organization in terms of a career, that's something lasting and powerful and meaningful. Uh, the other thing, frankly, I'm incredibly proud of is my marriage and relationship with my wife. I could not be who I am <laughs> or get through any of these days reasonably even keeled without her. I couldn't, and it's, it's a truly wonderful thing uh, for all you young people who've watched my VinWiki stories and have heard many things that always involve a new girlfriend and new cars. I will just simply say that I have collected a lot of data points to back up my uh, feelings, good feelings towards my marriage and my wife for the future. So I'm very proud of that. Uh, in terms of little things that I'm proud of, I was just insanely, unbelievably taken aback and honored that I got to fly with the United States Air Force Thunderbirds, that they would even have me to the base, let alone strap me into a jet uh, and let me tell that story. Uh, they represent the Air Force and I had to represent them on camera and they liked me because I wanted to come and work with them and get my hands dirty uh, and they liked the values at Genius Garage. So uh, it was just amazing. Uh, beyond that, I did get, believe it or not, what is the President's Lifetime Achievement Award uh, for my volunteer hours uh, 
through Genius Garage when I had over 4,000 unpaid hours uh, building the nonprofit with students. Um, I got a beautiful uh, certificate and uh, enameled in gold uh, badge from the, um, from the White House. And uh, whether we agree with any individual's politics, uh, that's still an amazing thing. And I was, I was really honored to get that and hang on the wall. What advice do you have for an upcoming mechanic? Oh, I got some good ones, you man. Okay, so upcoming, I assume you're reasonably young. So first and foremost, being a mechanic is tough on your body, okay? Just because you're young and heal well now, don't use your hand as a hammer. Don't like over wrench on things that hurts and um, you know, protect your lungs, protect your eyes. There's too many old guy mechanics that are dying a bad death because they didn't protect themselves. So that's first and foremost one, take care of yourself. If you don't take care of yourself, you can't continue with the career and then you're gonna be having a difficult time. So number one. Um, two, you are being paid your income and livelihood uh, to work on other cars. So you, you need to charge for it. You don't necessarily, you don't need to overcharge, like be fair, but uh, don't do somebody a favor unless they're doing you a favor um, that helps your life out. Because even though they're all smiles and all like you and whatnot, uh, that doesn't help you pay your bills. Okay. Also, there are good clients and there are bad clients. There are definitely clients worth saying, get out. Just get out. Like, um, but you know, in this day and age, you gotta be careful because then they'll go on the internet and like trash you or something. But th that's something too. Anybody honest is okay with signing contracts or agreements. Remember that. Uh, you need to have things in writing. You need to be very good. You need to know the laws to protect you because clients can mess up your deal and you need to be clear when they're gonna pick up a car or not because just little things that don't mean anything to the clients can really mess up your world and ability to make money and keep working. So all of these things um, you need to be steadfast on right now and you need to learn to be hard nosed about things. You can be diplomatic, you can be nice, but you need to know where your lines and walls are right now, okay? Um, those are, th that's my advice. Take care of yourself um, and be very intelligent with business and time and don't do people favors unless they know. Oh, and this one, you've got to listen to me right now. Here's the worst part of being mechanically inclined. Oh, for the love of God, famers, favors for family and friends. No, it is a horrible, slippery slope. It just, and, and then they expect you to magically fix it for nothing at any given time. And the other thing I've done is help people buy cars. Like I'll help you find a great car, a great deal on a car. And then when you do that, they think you're some magic dealership like that you have to fix it and do everything for it. No, I helped you get a good deal. You're on your own now, like have fun. So um, just remember, not everybody's you. And if you do favors, they're gonna want more favors and it's a slippery slope. So take care of yourself and business is business, okay? All right. What's the craziest thing you went through with Genius Garage? It's, uh, it's a lot of work, obviously, having to wear all those hats to build an organization, mentor students, and get something to work. Uh, obviously, there's personal sacrifices that are well worth it to make it happen. Uh, the craziest thing comes down to, and I've alluded to it with some Vinwicky stories, when the racing world and old guard and old boys club don't like it and get miffed because suddenly a bunch of college students that have never done this before and are doing it with a smaller budget than they are, are, are beating them and looking better and doing it for the future. Even though they're supposed to care about the future, that kind of kills their status quo and their egos and start to mess with you and make it hard. So uh, great life lessons for the students uh, and endurance for organizational leaders. But um, the craziest things are that. It, the people that uh, for some reason get their egos hurt and want to mess with you. Hmm. Interesting. Hopefully they'll, uh, they'll get on board in the future when they see how good it is. How do I find a fun car related job? Well, uh, a couple of things. One, you've got to put yourself out there. You've got to meet people. You've got to find opportunities. You've got to look for them. Uh, if you want to be a mechanic, you need to introduce yourselves, you need to see these people, and you need to be a young person with whom that they can respect, well-spoken and respectful, intelligent, but don't just be a fanboy. It's great to be super enth enthusiastic and love things, but that's not a job that doesn't make money for people, so you need to be somebody, bring some talent to the table, whatever that may be. Maybe you've only ever worked on radio control cars and bicycles, but that's talent. You've done something, you worked on a car. And even if you start out sweeping floors at a dealership or a service place or an exotic car restoration place, um, they'll start giving you a shot. Uh, and if they don't give you a shot, maybe somebody else will. So 
go out there, make things happen on your own, learn on it, volunteer to help work on cars with buddies or maybe somebody you meet in Cars and Coffee, be a respectful person and uh, be ready and willing and able to help somebody help their bottom line as a business and you'll probably become valuable enough to hire. How can someone learn to become a skilled mechanic and engineer like yourself in the modern world where shops aren't willing to take on use and shop classes fail to teach anything? That is a fantastic question. Uh, it's difficult. School systems, universities, colleges, not very hands-on. I realize there's SAE type programs, but they, they still don't do everything for you. And if you're younger, you're a young, young person, young teenager, and you're growing up, how do you do it? Well, all the engineering that goes into real cars, goes into radio control cars, the kind you build, not, not the ones you buy ready to run, but those kits and such. They go into model cars, they go into slot car racing, 124 scale slot car racing is a great place to craft and build these things. And as a shout out, I'm Genius Garage is leading a STEM program for young people ages like eight through 14 with 124 scale slot cars in Lincoln Park, uh, Michigan at Down River Speedway in Detroit. So there's great ways like that to learn and those are all the things I did when I was a young person. You take it apart, you fix it, things like Legos, all those things are great. When you start getting older, you help work on anything from tractors to lawnmowers, weed eaters, cars, you name it. Make buddies with mechanics, make buddies with people that work on stuff, learn, ask questions, build a go-kart, work on a little motorcycle or, or a scooter and you're gonna get your shot. You're gonna be good at fixing things, not just bolting on parts, because that's pretty easy, and go somewhere. Uh, I have zero formal training with being a mechanic, or, or craftsman, or fabricator. I learned all of these things from mentors, and along the way, and on the go, and obviously you guys have seen me do some pretty great things. I think the best motivation for learning is a drive to create. So if you have a drive to create and want something, find a path to get there and go there, but don't turn your nose up and snob on things like slot cars and road control cars on bicycles. Incredible engineering goes into that and they can be a lot of fun too. So that's my suggestion in going there. Uh, but you're right, uh, shops oftentimes do not want to deal with youths. Uh, depending on who they are, they just don't have time to train you. They don't want to deal with it. And actually that's a big problem in industry on giant world manufacturing levels as well. And the reason why Genius Garage has been such a powerful concept to create a talent pool that's truly ready for industry where academia is not able to completely do that. Craziest customer selling cars to. Oh man. Uh, usually the craziest people are not the ones who actually buy the cars. They're the ones that are all over the place. Um, I have bought and sold cars on my own in the past and met a lot of people. Usually they're pretty interesting people. They're enthusiasts of vintage race cars and classic cars. Uh, and I did spend a short time buying and selling classic cars at a little dealership. I seem to meet more characters, uh, but I, I think the craziest ones I remember from back in the day, when I was uh, selling my Countach, it was so hard to sell that car before the prices went up. The people would call you up and try like these weird, like sociopathic techniques to beat you up. And I'm like, never in my life selling a car have I been yelling at someone on the phone and we're arguing within three minutes on the phone call. It was the weirdest thing ever of just kind of this like manipulating back and forth and everything. And actually that really soured me to the experience of those kinds of cars at that moment. I'm, you know, not saying everybody's like that. Usually when you're selling high-end cars, uh, it's, it's pretty cut and dry and nice. But th there's been some wackos out there for sure. With everything you could have done, why did you choose to help students? And how have cars impacted your ability to make a difference in their lives? Well, obviously talking with uh, Genius Garage and building that. You know, first of all, thank you for saying with everything I've done, that means something to me that you think that I've uh, maybe accomplished something or done some neat things. Uh, but the reason why I chose to do this is because I was the young person who, that fell through every single crack, that, that just got kicked when they were down and up every, every step of the way, through school, from elementary school, high school, college. I didn't have the right manner. I didn't have the right direction. You know, one story that's that's nuts was when I was younger, probably like middle school, just, just out, out, out of elementary school. Uh, someone had thought like, why is this person not doing well in school? They seem to be really smart. Um, and had me do, you know, testing and like aptitude testing. And it was nuts because after that, as a young person, I went from being treated like crap at the school to suddenly the teachers were being nice to me. And I got to be in a higher level program, which I tested well, especially in mechanical aptitude and engineering and such. 
And I found out, and nobody told me more about it, but I found out that I could have been in different organizations and educational things and gone on different programs. And I kept asking as a young person, can I have the results so I can do this? And uh, they wouldn't let me have the results. Uh, and I found out many years later. And I just, I hated school because of it. So I went and built things. And I found, and in doing that as a young person or in business, when you fall through all the cracks and you get kicked in every way possible, you, you see the other side and you know what's wrong with it. And you know where young people um, are lost. And then as you get older in business and you figure out maybe how to build, how to lead, how to do things, you've grown as a person and, a, and an adult, you start to find the ways to make a difference. And I found a way to structure it. So the reason I choose to do that is because that those experiences as a young person um, were profound. And I just couldn't go out and only try to make money. I had to try to make the world better because I... Uh, it was it was so tough as a young person. I wanted to make it better in the future. So how have cars impacted my ability to better the lives of young people? Well, cars are an interesting thing. They've existed for over a century in basically every industrialized country in the world. They represent class, they represent sport, they represent utility, art, engineering. Everything that goes into the human experience goes into cars. And these old cars, whether it's a vintage racing car or a crazy movie prop hyper car, they all have incredible lessons to teach from that time period that made them great. So me being involved with cars and being part of that has allowed me to one, connect the students and my own life and organization to all the millions of amazing car people out there and relate as a community. But also these cars, these old cars have valuable lessons to teach in education. So instead of collecting dust in a museum, or a collection, I just decided that they should come out and teach and tell their stories. So cars have, have been everything in actually making the world a better place for young people. Do you think SpaceX or NASA will make it to Mars first? Okay, so we have to look at this and what those companies are and where we're going to make a decision. First of all, NASA is governmental United States owned, right? And the space race back in the day in the 60s to go to the moon was because we were trying to beat Russia and there was nuclear arms pro proliferations and such. And while it's really cool that we went to the moon, it was basically, we're gonna beat you, which kind of is a powerful force of mankind and is how we got there. The trouble is if everything's super peaceful everywhere, uh, people as humans are not that motivated to do something. And now that NASA, NASA is kinda, I see it more as a place to test so I foresee like our deep space rocket engines will probably be tested underground at Plumbrook and companies and people and governments or whatever will use NASA facilities to test, but I don't really think it's gonna be NASA leading the charge. Uh, SpaceX is amazing. Uh, Elon Musk has done an awesome job at creating a cultural movement for thinking of things like electric cars and space travel that didn't exist otherwise. So massive bravo there, but honestly, the reason why that's working or going there, it's not because it's an immediate profitable business entity, which is what makes a capitalistic country tick. There's also the huge cultural push that Elon has created to make people wanna do it, to make it exciting, to make space exploration matter to a culture. And that's what we need to drive it. Just as in the 60s, the culture was beat the Russians, right? Now it's we need to make the world and future better for young people and things like this, right? But. I think Elon is getting a little tired and a little older and he's going to need some secession planning and there's going to need to be a new figure and new people that can continually bring the culture of mankind together for space travel. So I think NASA will have a hand in it. Um, great testing facilities all over for people around the world and I think SpaceX could be a big part but I think there's going to need to be more of a future than just Elon. He, he can only, the man can only do so much. But I think SpaceX is a little closer to the spearhead than NASA on getting there. As a person who provides a platform for aspiring engineers to get hands-on experience, what are your thoughts on Formula SAE? Has it influenced Genius Garage? Well, uh, Formula SAE uh, is a great program um, that exists within the academia of colleges and universities around the world. SAE standing for Society of Automotive Engineers. There's also Mini Baja, which is similar where they build a, a smaller off-road vehicle. Uh, and there have been other programs that kind of fit this mold. It's a great place to start. 
If you can go to a college university that offers that program, that's great. It's a great opportunity. I think the difficulties for the from an SAE program around the world is each program at each university and college is by no means created equal. You could go to one big university and have virtually zero leadership and the kids are on their own, even if they've done good things in the past. And that's really difficult to learn uh, and find a good place and environment to really learn and grow. Um, but conversely, there could be some that could be really great uh, organizations. And I think a lot of their difficulties come through with that. They're not all the same. The other difficulty is it exists within the confines of academia, not in the real world of racing, um, which you need to transition to the real world. But it's still a great thing. So has it influenced Genius Garage? Yes, because I was actually part of Formula SAE back when I was in college. I saw what was great about it, and I saw where it could be better. So I decided to create Genius Garage to make the ultimate best experience. And yeah, there's some things that are similar to those programs in Genius Garage, but Genius Garage does many, many big things that are not doable within those confines. So I think Formula SA is a great thing, and if you have the opportunity, you should do it. Uh, and I think Genius Garage has similarities, but is uh, bigger in its scope, and then if you have the opportunity, you definitely should do that. So the Lycan project questions. This is on, of course, the Fast and Furious Lycan Hypersport body that Genius Garage is gonna be building in 2020. Where can we watch the Lycan build? Uh, two places, one, uh, I'm going to be making videos on my personal YouTube channel. That's simply Casey Putch on YouTube. And I'll put up Instagram pictures, of course, uh, since I'm the lead mentor of Genius Garage. Uh, there'll also be some stuff on Genius Garage's um, social media as well. But the primary place where you're gonna see a lot of great videos is uh, my YouTube channel, Casey Pitch, so subscribe there. Also, I will most definitely be coming back and doing updates and VinWiki stories on the build. They're gonna be very exciting, bringing my personal storytelling, <laughs> flair, whatever that may be, and students here with Ed, and I'm sure we're going to be doing some fun real-world adventures with Ed uh, Breadbolian <laughs> with the Lycan and, and some good car stuff there. What's your, the plan for the powertrain in the Lycan in Genius Garage? Okay, so the original Lycan had basically a roof spec Porsche uh, forced induction uh, flat six, mid-engine mounted. So we also are going to go the direction of a flat six Porsche mid-engine direction. Now, how much horsepower we build is going to come into resource management, what we have. Of course, more is always better, but then it's gotta be strong enough and good enough to cool it and maintain it and be a great driving car. So we're gonna keep it in line with what the Lycan was and uh, build it to be as good as we can, uh, being a Porsche derivative, mid-engine. Although it kinda is fun to think about doing an Ellis swap or even electric, but I think for this one, we need to make it Porsche. Do you think it will be easier or harder than the Batmobile build in reference to the Lycan? Uh, of course, y'all, or many of you know, I built the world's only turbine-powered Batmobile replica. Uh, which was effectively a really close emulation of the Tim Burton film. Uh, and I powered that with a drone anti-submarine helicopter engine. It was turbo shaft to power the wheels. So the Lycan build, in some ways it'll be easier, in a numbers of other ways, harder. The easier part of it is uh, starting with a Porsche to cut up and use those parts uh, gets you in the ballpark. Also, there's gonna be a lot of bolt-ons and things that can be custom made in the automotive world that'll work really well for that, whether that's big brake kits, special wheels, the tires, the coilovers, um, if we're gonna utilize help with forced induction or building motors. Uh, those things are relatively simple because the automotive industry is big. Whereas for a Batmobile with a random ex-military engine, not as big of an aftermarket. So that's a little simpler. However, the places that will be difficult with the Lycan are making it very beautiful. It's a complicated shape. You've got doors that open and close, windows, you've got air brakes and speed wings, things that actuate. We have to build headlights and taillights from scratch, potentially with diamonds in them. So there's a lot of fabrication, potential programming, wiring, composites, that's, that's going to be trickier than the Batmobile actually was. Uh, but I think it's gonna be really rewarding. So there's there's gonna be challenges the whole way, but we're gonna make a very nice running and driving car. Uh, so naturally it's gonna take some effort. Are you going to try to lighten the fiberglass panels or make new ones out of lighter materials for the Lycan? Well, that is a good question. Uh, this particular prop, uh, the shell is road hard and put away wet. It got shot out of a cannon, literally, that looked like an airplane, I don't know, two or three stories in the air, and <laughs> took some impacts. So it's got some stress cracks, chips, things like that that are ugly, have to be fixed. That being said, the fiberglass was actually laid up really nice. It's not that thick. 
Uh, it's kind of in the quality level of what I would call uh, an IMSA Corvette, you know, sort of like what the Genus Garage one is. It's thick for a race car, but it's okay for a street car. So it's, it's pretty okay. I'll put it that way as is. So it's gonna need some love to make what it is better. I think making some new panels out of carbon would, uh, would be a really great step. It'd look good, it'd be lighter, it'd be stronger. And that's gonna be important for things maybe like the big clamshell that opens up, the speed brake, the hood, and maybe the intricacies of the front and rear bumpers. So uh, you'll just have to watch the build on Casey Poach's YouTube channel and the VinWiki channel to find out. How much is it the expected cost of the Lycan build? Well, uh, cost can differ from millions of dollars to inexpensive, you're just gonna slap something together. We're obviously gonna be in the middle of there somewhere. With any build, there's kind of the law of diminishing returns, you know? So your, your returns are really good, but they start to taper off and your costs go up. And usually the best place to stop is right where those two things meet. So obviously we have to get the shell, we have to buy some sort of donor car, there's a cost in that. Uh, there's gonna be your raw materials, could be carbon, epoxies, uh, metal, um, hardware, things like that, and that adds up pretty quickly. Uh, who knows, we may have to get some new tools. Um, there's there's you know wheels, uh, tires, things like that that add up quickly. Perhaps we will be fortunate enough to find a good sponsor or donor for some companies out there that might be part of that. Engines get expensive. So my hope is to keep the expenses relating to, obviously we got the shell, getting the donor car, the raw materials, and hopefully uh, companies will help support and be part of this in that way for the students so that any money that we have, we can stretch as far as is possible uh, for one, the students, because building this is an educational program. It is for the betterment of the young people and of course, putting our best foot forward for the organization. So this is really about education, but we wanna make a really good product. So I would simply say on those costs, stay tuned for this build process, both on VinWiki and my channel and Genius Garage, because we're gonna learn along the way uh, and at the same times when we find these hurdles. What is your goal for the new Genius Garage Lycan build? If you can say anything, and is your goal to build it exactly like or near to how it came from the factory? Well, the first goal is obviously a great educational experience for the students and something that'll put our best foot forward as an organization and gaining good media exposure. We, I hope you all watch and share it. This is going to be an unbelievable thing to take part of and that's good for the organization and students. Now the car itself, first and foremost, this will be a good running and driving sports car, period. Something that one, will be beautiful. You could park it at any Concours, any hangar party, any dealership showroom and be like, wow, that is gorgeous. You could park it next to an original one and, and just be like, wow. And it would maybe take a minute for people to realize, wait a minute, this doesn't look original. So not necessarily going to be an exact flawless replica, but obviously emulate what it was as the movie prop in a fun way. Uh, and reflect all of the engineering and design there. But who knows, maybe we'll take a little bit of an artistic license here or there with the interior, but all in good keeping. Obviously it's gotta perform well. I, uh, I like going fast and I like racing. I know my students do well too. So obviously acceleration, braking, uh, turning, everything like that, but none of, that perform none of those performance figures are any good if you can't have a car that you can't put a lot of miles on reliably. And I mean both on a road course and on the actual street. I think it'd be important, I think it'd be really cool if this particular build ends up accruing more miles on the street than all of the original real ones put together. Not sure what that number is, but I have a feeling we can do it in short order and it's gonna be a really great car. A, a lot of fun. I think it's gonna give a lot of memories uh, of Fast and Furious movies. Uh, and this is gonna really mean something to the young people that get to put it together and build a car old school. So uh, the goal, build an awesome car and uh, get these students amazing jobs and uh, great publicity for Genius Garage. And the last question, what are your goals for next year? Well, uh, there's different categories there, of course. Uh, for Genius Garage, obviously pushing the organization as far forward as possible and growing that to my, the overall vision, getting students unbelievable jobs uh, and having meaningful fun along the way. Uh, me as just Casey Putch, some car guy on the side. I'm looking forward to putting together, finishing up my custom Ducati, the Top Gun Maverick build bike, and my anti-snub Porsche 944, 924 builds on my YouTube channel and uh, driving that. Uh, I need to go on vacation with my wife. She deserves it a lot. So go, go on vacation and enjoy it. <laughs> 
just the two of us. Uh, beyond that, I look forward to connect with all of you, uh, to have a great collaboration and relationship more with Ed uh, here at VinWiki and this channel and Genius Garage. So I just think so many great things in the car cultures coming. Um, and personal goals, gosh, that's really it. Being part of that car culture, uh, having fun with VinWiki, building my own YouTube channel, making Genius Garage be an amazing organization. I really wanna go on vacation with my boy. <laughs> so that's really it guys. Those are all the questions for today that we could answer. I did see all of your others and I'll do my best to answer it. I hope you guys will keep watching and asking on Instagram and YouTube. I do my best to answer them and talk to you guys uh, and sometimes give a little bit of friendly crap to the trolls. <laughs> so it'll be good. And that's, that's it for today. We are here at VinWiki, 1 million subscribers. Yes, it's a huge milestone. I'm excited to be a small part of it. Even more excited for Ed and the car community and culture as a whole. The VinWiki app is, an, is a powerful and I think a fun tool to utilize. So I hope you guys are doing that. Um, and it, it's just gonna be a great ride here for the future. Obviously gonna come back telling stories of Genius Garage and the Lycan, and I'm sure I'll have some wild ones in the future. Maybe some of you will get to tell stories and that for all of you new subscribers to come, maybe you won't be one in that first million, but we are honored to have you here and look forward to bringing more stories in the future. Thanks guys. This month's car stories are sponsored by The Ridge. The Ridge makes a line of wallets and bags that are designed to be minimalist and help us just take with us the things we actually need. So check out the link in the description below for a discount and buy one for yourself or they make great Christmas presents and be sure to let them know how thankful you are for their support of VinWiki.